Okay, hi. Um, I'm here with Ryan McDonald, the Mars One candidate today. Um, how are you doing, Ryan? I'm doing very well. How are you doing, Heidi? I'm good. Um, so, uh, how about you um, tell us a little about what you think of um, your involvement in Mars One so far? Well, it's a very exciting time at the moment with Mars One, just waiting to hear back um, the interview results and the interviews. Well, there's a couple of people who are just finishing them, but um, it's really exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm nervous, obviously, as are many of the other candidates, about um, whether we are through or not. Uh, so, fingers crossed, but um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just, everything's exciting in the Mars One world, and it's building up to a crescendo at the moment. So, yeah, I can't wait to see what happens next. Okay, awesome. <laughs> uh, so, how did you hear about Mars One in the first place? Oh, that was what... Um, I believe I remember seeing the original Mars One YouTube video um, describing their project plans back in 2012, and I was just, I saw that, and I was interested straight away because here were people who weren't just saying, oh, we'll go to Mars 20 years from now, they were saying 10 years, and that they weren't just planning to plant a flag and then come home, they were planning to set up something permanent and really achieve something. It was like science fiction becoming reality. So that, that got me excited, and excited enough actually to travel halfway across uh, England all the way up to Scotland actually just to see Baz Landstorp uh, come and give a talk and that's when I got a chance to ask him loads of my own technical questions about the project with, because obviously I was a little sceptical as a scientist myself when you first hear it because it is wonderful but um, he was able to answer all of my questions I was very impressed by the depth of his knowledge and that's when I truly started following and supporting the project Awesome. So uh, I understand you've got a presentation on Mars when I'm um, coming up. Uh, how about you tell us a little about that? Oh, right. Yes. So, um, well, it'll, it will have finished just about a week from today, actually. So uh, Sunday, the 1st of February, I'll be traveling uh, to Belgium to give a talk at the FOSDEM 15 conference, um, which is all about, it's mainly about open source software and developing open source and things. Um, but I want to talk specifically about how the Mars One project can benefit from an open source approach where they put out ideas and then engineers and knowledgeable people from across the planet collaborate and criticize the plans in order to make them as solid as possible so we can really make sure this mission succeeds. And I'm really excited because there'll be an audience, there's around 5,000 people going to be at the conference, so it'll be the uh, biggest audience I've spoken to yet about Mars One. And yeah, that's going to be a very interesting occurrence. Awesome. I bet you'll have fun there. Oh, absolutely. Well, I'm planning to meet up with some of the uh, Belgian Mars One candidates there, so it'll be great getting to meet some Mars One candidates that I haven't yet. Awesome. So, uh, I understand you have a lot of um, um, uh, uh, Mars One related videos on your YouTube channel. <laughs> oh, there's, there's always more to come, but um, yeah, yeah, I, I decided to start doing more regular YouTube videos about Mars One. I think I started the first ones around April time. Um, just I, I, I felt that uh, because Mars One's obviously very busy behind the scenes with lots of the technical aspects and negotiating deals, I thought it'd be helpful to provide monthly updates on what was happening with Mars One for anyone who was interested. And I've had a great reception from those, and I like making missions about, sorry, videos about specific aspects, common questions like, how do you deal with radiation? Are we going to survive dust storms, for example? So I thought it was better because I was all, you. I kept getting certain questions asked to me personally all the time. So I thought, aha, but if I make a video about it, then the question is always answered. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Um, so, um, so have you always been interested in space travel? Oh, yeah. E ever since I was young. I was interested in two things when I was young, and that was space and dinosaurs. <laughs> um, <laughs> so so um, my plan when I was about this tall was basically, hey, let's, let's go to the moon and then look for fossils and do some digging and things up there. That combines the best of both worlds. But, uh, yeah, so I, I gradually fell out of interest um, with the, the dinosaurs and looked, became more future-looking uh, towards... Um, Oh, one thing you know, that I was quite interested in uh, writing when I was younger, I wanted to be an author. Um, so, in fact, I've turned more recently to writing science fiction. In fact, I've written um, one science fiction novel, which I'm just going to sit down and actually finish the proofreading of, which I hope to do this summer. 
Um, but yeah, space has always been a, a big focus for me. Um, it, one of the most inspirational things that I can think of was when I got a chance to meet the first official British astronaut, Major Tim Peake, who will be going up to the space station this November. Um, so that that, re that was one thing that just really inspired me to believe not just um, not just that I was interested in space, but that maybe one day I could actually go myself. And with obviously all these private initiatives starting up, SpaceX, for example, uh, Virgin Galactic, I think it's certainly feasible that within things on the order of the next decade or so, that average people can go into space. So it's a very exciting time to be alive in. Awesome. Uh, is there um, anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, oh, and if you... I could easily ramble about things very easy. Let's see. Uh, ah, yes, one thing that's very interesting. Let's talk about the Fermi paradox. Um, so in case you're, th this is, I think it's important when you're interested in becoming a scientist to identify one question that you want to make it the focus of your life to, if not answer, at least contribute towards. And the big one that's fascinated me is the simple question of where is everyone? Because from what we know of the laws of physics, life should be common throughout the entire universe, and we've not found any evidence of it yet. So where is everyone? Um, so I figure, hey, I could go to Mars and look for life there, for example, and if I were to find life, what I'd be interested in doing would be to sequence its genetic code to find out whether it's related to Earth life or whether it's an entirely new form of life that we've never seen. Because if it's, if it's related to Earth life, then we could find out that the origin of life might have been on Mars, for example, which would be a fascinating conclusion. But if it's entirely different, it tells us that two next-door planets completely independently evolved life, and therefore life fills the entire universe. And if for whatever reason I don't get the chance to go to Mars myself, then I plan to go on into research, complete a PhD, and basically look for planets around other stars and try to understand what kind of gases are there in their atmospheres, I mean, we've seen recently the big fuss about methane being discovered on Mars, so I would like to look for methane on exoplanets. Um, so, yeah, that's why I'm really excited in the search for life. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs>